We're coming up quickly on the boundary where the subject of patterns goes deeper into origins and destinies and more speculation. Before we do that though, let's do a quick review. Somewhere in the deep space of every human being is a simple machine that performs nothing less than cosmic magic. It comes in two acts, actually. It compares stuff, then formulates a pattern based on that comparison. It's usually already running when we're born, and while we may be able to optimize its performance through education, it runs in the background, investing us with a stunning harvest of information about the cosmos. That's the main point so far. We make patterns, we see patterns. And when we stand back, we also notice something unexpected. Some patterns show up again and again and again. Temporal objects, things that exist within time, tend to have springs, summers, falls, and winters about them. It seems to be a dimensional rule. But the point is, it didn't have to be this way. Once blackout is achieved, blackout should or could be eternal. And it's not. That's curious. After winter's death comes spring and resurrected life. And the cosmic surprise is, at the heart of it all, we find our simple machine pumping away. Starting with little or nothing, it proceeds to grow our understanding of these things and the universe. It is nothing short of stunning. So, what about the patterns that come from this little metaphor maker of ours? The first patterns usually contribute to a high-level topographical overview for what will eventually define a complex system. A forest ecology, for example, might include trees, rivers, animals, and humans. The interaction of these components may lead to patterns of cause and effect, and maybe even the who of the problem, assuming there is one. Another example. What about language? The ecological snapshot for language includes a brain, lungs, a tongue, and a number of unknown components and interactions. Though we don't understand everything there is to know on the subject of language, our topographical knowledge makes it at least explorable. Let's say you come home, you find your husband staggering around saying things like, I want a cat. I've never had a cat. You you have a cat every day. Knowing how much your husband hates this animal, you examine the topography, the ecological view for an explanation. Now, if there are 30 empty beer cans behind the sofa, the ecology suggests a link between the consumption of alcohol and the neurotransmitters in your husband's brain. In an instant, you've got the who, what, when, and where of this thing. And by the time you're finished with the boy, you'll have the why as well. If there are no empties, though, and there is a bump on his head instead, the ecology suggests a slight concussion. And that's why he's talking crazy. That's why he wants a cat. But if there is no bump, if there are no empties, the big pattern might be telling you your husband had a stroke. The ecology, together with the sub-patterns of cause and effect, suggest a link between crazy talk, inebriation, head trauma, and cat ownership. In his book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, physicist Stephen Barr describes the discovery of a previously unknown particle, the omega minus particle. It was predicted by pattern. In particle physics, there are two important properties known as hypercharge and isospin. In each particle, the mathematical characteristics defining these properties tend to be precise. In 1962, researcher Murray Gell Mann noticed when you graph these particles according to hypercharge and isospin values, what you get is a triangle. Well, almost a triangle. Obviously, there's something missing at the tip end. Logic tells you there must be one more hydron hiding somewhere. And that's how the omega minus was predicted and eventually discovered. The pattern, an upside down and slightly incomplete triangle, anticipated 
and advance in understanding. And that's what they do. Patterns give us explanations. Patterns help us explore.